Mars, the stars uh, remain in sky, in blue sky. It's nice. If we go there, impossible. The coming generation, they should think the present planet, blue planet, is only our home. Thank you. In normal years, the Office of Tibet in London would celebrate the birthday of His Holiness the Dalai Lama with friends and supporters of the Office of Tibet and the London Tibet House Trust. But today, for the second year running, we are forced to celebrate this event via a webinar due to the continuation of restrictions imposed because of coronavirus pandemic. But we are going global in our celebration and paying tribute to His Holiness the Dalai Lama by remembering one of his core concerns and contributions to the humanity, and that is on the urgent environmental issues facing our planet. His Holiness has become one of the great world leaders of our time, a universal figure of great spiritual and moral authority, champion of human values, a spokesperson for peace and a fervent campaigner for environmental environment with universal responsibility, who commands the respect of people everywhere, including heads of states, religious leaders, fellow Nobel laureates, environmentalists, scholars, philosophers, as well as ordinary men and women all over the world. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been a vocal campaigner for the environment for a very long time. In his landmark call in 1987, His Holiness visualized Tibet acting as a zone of peace in the heart of Asia, not just political peace or military peace, but also the environmental peace, an idea that is central to the Tibetan belief and world view. His speeches at the Survival Earth Summit in 1988 in Oxford, United Kingdom, followed by United Nations Rio Earth Summit in 1992 in Brazil, have become a master plan for clearing the planet Earth with compassion and universal responsibility for each citizens of our world. This year, the United Nations Climate Change Conference COP26 will be held in the United Kingdom, and as there is much expectation that politicians, diplomats, and heads of states will concentrate on achieving agreement in net zero emission dates and target global climate temperature, the Office of Tibet London is also concentrating and highlighting the deterioration of climate changes impact of the Tibetan Plateau. Last week, we organized a conference addressing the climate change crisis on the Tibetan Plateau in London, and we are very happy to link this important subject as part of our celebration to take it further, road to COP26 with two distinguished environmentalists environmental journalists who have worked closely with His Holiness the Dalai Lama on this particular subject. I'm most humble and excited to present a panelist of phenomenal and exceptional individuals to be with us today to celebrate the 86th birthday of the great 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet with a subject that is important to His Holiness, to the world for now, and future. So before I uh, announce <coughs> our speakers, I want to run with the sketch of our program today. Each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes. 
after the presentation, there will be questions and answers. And for the viewers who are visiting us through the Facebook, if they have questions, please put them on the comment section of the Facebook. So let me introduce Dr. Franz Alts. Dr. Franz Alts is a German environmental journalist who has been promoting the vision of a renewable energy world for more than two decades because of the understanding of many of the world's most pressing problems, Dr. Alves has become one of the most important public advocates for renewable energy in Germany and far beyond. In 2017, he was awarded the World Wind Energy Award during the 16th World Wind Energy Conference in Malmö, Sweden, for his extraordinary contribution to the international dissemination of wind power and renewable energy. He is also a television presenter, a writer. He co-authored the book with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, including the book The Only Home, a climate appeal to the world in 2020, on which he will base his talk today. So Dr. Alts, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you, Sona. Firstly, happy birthday to His Holiness. Uh, long life and good health. I think a long life for the next uh, 30, 40 or 50 years to him. Dear friends and brothers and sisters of uh, the Dalai Lama, what is our main problem today? Today's economies and today's energy policies are on their last legs. Our economical program is a suicidal program. In one day, we consume as much coal, gas or oil as nature created in one million days. We organize our self-immolation. Today, we consume the future of our children and grandchildren. The old energy policies mean wars about resources, environmental destruction and ever increasing costs. In this book I wrote together with the Dalai Lama, we can look for alternatives. We have all the necessary technologies we need for this change. It is not yet too late to change. The question is not if we can compensate the old energies. The only question is if we can compensate the old energies in time. Every day the sun gives us 15,000 times more energy than all 8 billion peoples use at present. The rise of sun are the greatest gift from the cosmos to us. The sun is the only source of income that this world has. If we reduce the old energies and increase the renewable energies, the result will be a 100% use of renewable energies. Energy from biomass, sun, wind, water and geothermy. We need the whole symphony of renewables. If we succeed in achieving this, then an energy scenario for 2035 can look like this. About 40 to 50 percent of our energy will come directly from the sun. About 15 percent from biomass and biogas. About 30 percent from of the energy will come from wind and about 10 percent of the energy will come from water power. This is a world scenario. New energy means also new jobs. In renewable energies, we have meantime more than 10 million jobs. And in 2025, we will have about 25 million jobs in renewables. 
CES, the International Agency of Renewable Energy, IRENA. After the destruction of the last world war, we in Germany achieved an economic miracle. And from now on, we have the possibility to create a new miracle all over the world. This time, a worldwide ecological miracle. But the renewable energy, 100% renewables, is the precondition for the worldwide ecological miracle. In the future, we will drive and we can drive electrical cars. And the electricity will come from the sun and from the wind. Some examples for this solar age in the future. In Germany, the first solar energy plus houses we have been built 25 years ago. These houses produce three times more electricity than the house owners need. This is good for the environment, but it is good too for the pocket. Because the house owners can sell the sun electricity on the basis of our German renewable energy law. 70 countries all over the world have overtaken this German law, including China and India. Economy and ecology come together. This is our chance. Ecology without economy doesn't make sense. But economy without ecology doesn't make sense too. But in the future, the ecology will become the more intelligent economy. In our own house, here in the house I sit now here, we have been producing solar energy for 30 years now. And I can assure you that in those 30 years, we have never received a bill from the sun. What are we waiting for? Millions of houses all over the world are waiting to become solar buildings, mainly in sun countries like Africa, India, Bangladesh, South America, and so on. In the year 2000, we produced a kilowatt hour solar electricity for 70 euro cents. Very expensive 20 years ago. But in the meantime, we can produce a solar kilowatt hour for 5 euro cents in Europe. That's because of the mass production of the solar cells. From 70 cents to 5 cents in 20 years. But mainly because sun and wind don't send us a bill. That means solar policy is social policy. I'm convinced that in 10 years, a kilowatt hour solar electricity will cost in Europe two cents and one cent in Africa or in India. In my book, The Ecological Jesus, Trust in Creation, I have recommended the clergy and the origins to install solar panels in their churches, thus creating a landing runway for the Holy Ghost. In the meantime, we have in Germany 2,000 churches with solar panels. Solar energy is not just practical. It can be aesthetically very pleasant. Since 10 years, even the Vatican in Rome has his first solar panels. Energy from above for Pope Francesco. Heavenly energy. 30,000 windmills in Germany have taken the place of 12 atomic power stations. Small is beautiful. China, the United States, Germany, Spain, Denmark, or India lead the world at present in wind power. And now we are moving offshore, and thus we will harvest even more wind energy with offshore windmills. It's easier to store the electricity. To store the electricity in the future, we need a combination of all six renewable energy resources, including a combination of offshore wind parks and onshore wind parks. But we need better batteries, too. And we need, in the long run, hydrogen and the techniques of power to gas. Renewable energy 
is also good for the employment market. Renewable energy is not a job killer, but the job creator in the future. New energy, new jobs, new mobility. In all countries, all over the world, we can cover 100% of our energy needs. Nature had, has placed at our disposal everything we need. We can work towards a world in which no child should go, should go hungry or starve. Only with the help of renewables plus education plus water, we can overcome hunger in the world. Only with renewable energies in economic develop is economic development really viable in the so-called third world. Africa and the sun, Latin America and the sun, Arabia and the sun, South Asia and the sun. What a vision. The people in the so-called third world have no more reasons to flee. They have an economical basis in African countries, but only with renewable energy, with water and education. The three pillars for a better world are renewables, water and education. Our world is full of renewable energy. Nature gives us all we need. During my last TV program, I asked the Dalai Lama, what is religion today? His answer was, only those who can take an active part in realizing the true nature of creation can call themselves religious. Therefore, I published together with the Dalai Lama also this book. It is translated meantime in 23 languages, Ethics are more important than religion. And then the book we speak today, Our Only Home. Ethics are more important than religion, a remarkable statement of one of the most charismatic religion leader of the world. And that means we have an ecological ethics. The change in energy is possible. With the help of renewable energies, we can make poverty history. Sun, wind, water, biomass, and so on, are our elementary future. Let us start in the solar age. This is our future, and it is a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Arts. Thank you very much for the presentation. Now, let me uh, introduce our second speaker, Michael Buckley. Michael Buckley is an award-winning Canadian photojournalist who, among other things, wrote the first Lonely Planet's first book guide to Tibet in 1986. He is a freelance travel writer and a photographer. He has traveled extensively throughout Southeast Asia and the Himalayan region and Karakoram ranges. He made two short documents about major environmental issues in Tibet. He is an author of many books, including his last book, The Fragile Planet, His Holiness the Dalai Lama on environment. So on this, this fantastic book on which he will be giving a talk today to celebrate the 86th birthday of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So Michael, the screen is yours. Oh, thank you. I just want to do a sound check. Is everything okay? You can see me, you can hear me? Perfect. We good? We good? We good? Okay. Um, yes, I've I think a little correction there. The book is not yet published, the one you showed us. Um, it'll be published in September. <laughs> but uh, apart from that, anyway, I'm honored to be here on this highly auspicious occasion to wish His Holiness a happy 86th birthday and to wish him long life because we need him. 
We need his vision, we need his voice, we need his inspiration in a world sadly lacking in moral values and a world sadly lacking in vision to solve the climate emergency that we now face. Um, so this is what this book is about, this book here. It's about inspiration, featuring quotations, which you just saw actually in the first video, you saw some quotations, we've also got the book, uh, matched to photographs from a dozen professional photographers, half of whom remain anonymous. Um, after what has transpired so far in 2021, I'm seriously thinking of changing the title to A Very Fragile Planet, because um, I'm afraid to look at the news these days. It's just one crisis after another, you know, and that environment is just, I don't know what's happening. It's just, it's a compounding, it's accelerating. So um, the title of the book actually comes from a, a quotation from His Holiness, and the quotation is very, very uh, central to what I'm going to talk about today which is, um, you know, here's the, here's the quotation. I'll read it from the book. Over the years, since our first arriving in exile, I have taken a close interest in environmental issues. The Tibetan government in exile has paid particular attention to introducing our children to their responsibilities as residents of this fragile planet. Now, that is activism. It, it's telling children not only to learn about the uh, environment, but to take, to take responsibility for their actions and to consider how their actions will affect the environment. And this is where His Holiness has been very, very strong, is in the education field, um, because uh, he figured out very early in stages that, you know, that was what was lacking in the Tibetan system. They needed a good education. Uh, so His Holiness often talks about the term fragile in the context of Tibet's fragile ecosystems, uh, under siege from the Chinese occupiers of Tibet. Um, the, you know, Tibet is a very fragile, high-altitude ecosystem. We have glaciers, many glaciers, 38,000 glaciers, uh, the most glaciers of any uh, place on, on the planet. Uh, vast grasslands, they're enormous, uh, and then mighty rivers, uh, eight river systems that flow through Asia. And once damaged, these ecosystems take a very long time to recover. Um, but His Holiness doesn't stop there. He looks way beyond Asia, into, uh, way beyond Tibet, into Asia, across the globe, in terms of our responsibilities to Mother Earth. I'm going to read you another quote, uh, which is not from His Holiness. It's from a climate scientist called uh, Gus Beth, American climate scientist. And um, here's his quote. I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought the 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Um, but, you know, uh, as it happens, um, Tibetan Buddhism and um, His Holiness are well positioned to deal with that because they've been dealing with ethics for thousands of years. Uh, so what we need is a set of ethics that can deal with that, a spiritual transformation a shift of consciousness to deal with what we call climate change, but actually what you should call climate chaos at this point, or climate disruption. So His Highness has uh, stated four lifelong commitments, and his third lifelong commitment is to preserve Tibetan culture and environment. So in the cause of protecting the environment, he promotes the values of secular ethics, universal responsibility, respect for all living beings, the notion of interdependence, which uh, that all species play a role, uh, in our ecosystems, which we might better recognize as the concept of biodiversity. And above all, he is promoting compassion for Mother Earth. Treat her as you would your own mother, which is unfortunately something that we are not seeing in Tibet itself. Uh, Tibetan ecosystems are falling apart due to the reckless and irresponsible policies of the Chinese occupiers of Tibet. Uh, they have laid waste to the rivers with mega dams. They've destroyed grasslands with mega mining. So they've contributed to the rapid meltdown of glaciers even, with the rain of black soot that comes from extensive burning of fossil fuels both in China and India. Um, some 35 years ago, I went to Tibet to write the first ever English guidebook to the nation, The Lonely Planet, and I returned for a number of trips for guidebook work, updating, and then I sort of changed fields. I went into another kind of writing about environment, because the things that I thought would never change, the magnificent snow caps, the vast grasslands, the powerful rivers, were changing right before my eyes. Um, and um, I'll give you one instance of this because I remember it very, very clearly. Uh, a number of times I passed by the turquoise blue Yamdrokso 
in central Tibet. It's a fantastic, beautiful landscape where I photographed black neck cranes, other unique bird species. It's a sacred lake, highly revered by Tibetans, and has uh, only a few Tibetan villages close to the shores and a single monastery at Samding. And I'll show you actually a, what this lake looks like. I don't know if you can see this here. This is a panorama of the lake. I hope you can see that. Um, it's a wonderful lake. And then on one trip back in the 1990s, I came over a high pass to Yamdrok So, and there was a huge building underway on the shores. And I, I could not believe it. It was not a Tibetan building. It was a Chinese pump storage dam underway to supply a small amount of power to Lhasa. Now, I'm all for progress, but this, progress, this project made absolutely no sense. Why destroy a sacred lake like this? You can earn a lot more from tourism at the lake than exploiting it with a dam that produces very, very little electricity. The dam caused a huge controversy with an international effort underway to block the building of the dam, but it went ahead anyway. And that is the Chinese mentality. We need to change the consciousness of the Chinese if Tibet's ecosystems are to survive at all. And this shift in consciousness is actually something that His Holiness has talked about, the need to educate Chinese in their responsibilities towards the environment. Um, so His Holiness has been involved for a very long time in environmental issues. I'm going to show you a book here called The uh, Tree of Life. You can see that uh, properly there. Um, that's back in 1987. Uh, he provided an introduction. It's translated into Tibetan and Thai languages, introduced by him. And um, he used uh, part of the quote that he made on World Environment Day 1986. And then later, he wrote a 36, 30 stanza poem uh, called Sheltering Tree of Interdependence, dated 1993, to mark the opening of the International Conference on Ecological Responsibility taking place in New Delhi. Uh, how many leaders can you think of that write long environmental themed poetry? I cannot think of any myself. The entire poem is quoted in English in Franz Alt's book. Um, I've accepted it excerpted a few, uh, a handful of stanzas in my book. And I'm going to shift to photographs. Um, my collaborative book is based on a number of photos that attempt to convey the vast scale of Tibet, the unique ecosystems of the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, and there are some panoramic images in the book, uh, which is the way I always remember Tibet. It's a very vast, big, sweeping, and silent place. So here's, uh, this is dawn in Tibet. There's a few panoramas in this book. This is dawn in Tibet at Everest. Uh, this will take your breath away because if you're at 5,000 meters, it's not very difficult to take your breath away anyway. Um, but anyway, we're going to show a few photos and um, we're going to call upon um, uh, the moderator there to, sh to show us the first photograph. Can we bring a first picture up? We have some pictures there. First picture coming up. You can make it a little bit bigger. Can you? Bring the size up. Yes. Okay. That's great. Uh, so what we're looking at here is uh, Tibetan antelopes. Um, Chiru. Why are we looking at antelopes? Because at age four, when he was on his way to Lhasa um, from Amdo, the four-year-old Dalai Lama, uh, he writes it in his autobiography, the, the main thing that he remembered on this trip was the herds of animals that he saw, majestic herds of animals, gazelles, uh, wild yaks, kiang, and um, you know, I, I don't know how he remembered that at four years old, but he did. And uh, you know, this is something you'll never see in Tibet now. You'll never see these herds of animals. I've never seen a wild yak. I've traveled extensively in Tibet. I've never seen a wild yak. I've seen them in cap, not even in captivity. I've ever seen a wild yak. Uh, but anyway, they're all gone. You'll be lucky to see four or five churu together. And what happened was that. Um, they were estimated to number over a million antelope in the early 1900s. By 1990, by the 1990s, the number had plummeted to no more than 100,000. Uh, they were massacred for their valuable underwood, underwall, the finest wool in the world. Uh, His Holiness says in another quotation that the beautiful landscapes ring hollow without the wildlife in them. And that is a sad case for Tibet today. It can be salvaged, they can rebound, but they need a lot of uh, work. Anyway, next picture. And bring up the next photo there. Okay, um, as I mentioned before, um, this is His Holiness with a couple of Tibetan youths. He is very personally involved in education, and um, he was involved in the setting up of the first uh, Tibetan school in 1960. Why? Because he knew that uh, one of the reasons that Tibet uh, suffered uh, and was invaded was uh, lack of education. It was an important factor. 
and he was determined that uh, this this factor be remedied. So he didn't want um, he, you know wanted Tibetans have, have their own schools, the TCVs. Um, next picture. Uh, here we're looking at uh, jumping ahead a lot because I don't have a lot of pictures. We jump ahead in 1988 in Oxford, UK. Um, His Holiness is um, at a climate conference with um, 200 scientists and world leaders. So his environmental activism goes back a long way. Um, and he has been to so many conferences like this. One, as you mentioned, there was one in Brazil, the role over India, uh, Europe. He's been to many of these conferences. He's been to, he's talked on important days. He's done a lot of things. Uh, let's go to the next picture. Of course, probably the most important thing that people can remember about him is the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo. And it's interesting to think that this is the first ever awarded on the basis of environmental protection. Of course, he was talking about a zone of peace uh, between China and India, but he was also talking about ecology. He was talking about uh, preserving this as a natural um, area. And uh, oddly enough, this vision has come to pass in uh, in, China, in Tibet today, the Chinese claim that over 50% of Tibetan regions within China are made of national parks and protected areas, but this turns out to be paper, paper parks, which are only good on paper only. Uh, it looks good for international things, but actually it's fake. Uh, let's jump ahead to the next picture. Um, this is COP Madrid, um, December, we're jumping ahead 30 years, December 2019. Uh, I was there talking at a side event. Uh, Tibet needs to be front and center stage in all of these uh, COPs, but it's not. And it's very weird because uh, Tibet's rivers feed a, a third of the world's population of 7.8 billion. You know, you, you count the heavily populated nations of China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Vietnam. Why is Tibet not part of the conversation? It's supplying all these, all these nations. It needs to be part of the conversation. So we have Glasgow coming up this year. Um, actually, what, what you're looking at the picture is... Um, uh, TPI uh, had put a poster of His Holiness on a van to drive it around Madrid to get their message across. That's how desperate you have to be to get the message across um, because it's not getting through. Uh, next picture. And um, here we have His Holiness's, oh, what do we have here? Oh, yes, okay. The uh, early this year, January of uh, this year, this is. Um, uh, the Mind Life Institute set up a meeting between His Holiness and Greater Thunberg, climate scientists, the launch of five films about environment, environmental issues. And um, it's very interesting that um, His Holiness is targeting youth uh, because he realizes that, you know, this is their future. And, you know, uh, Greater Thunberg, uh, she's a teenager, but there's one in India who's even younger than Greater Thunberg. She's 12 years old. Um, and, you know, I've written a children's book because I believe that, you know, you have to start them young, eight years old, to, to get hold of this problem, to do something about it. So let's continue with the next picture. Uh, this is the uh, book launch of a dream that His Holiness has had for decades. Um, it's the SEE uh, learning curriculum, um, which is the uh, social, emotional, and ethical learning project, uh, which is education of the heart and mind. So he's always been along of the opinion that we're educating the mind, but we're not educating the heart. So we're lacking in moral values, which will direct the other things. And uh, let's go to the last photo here. The last photo shows uh, His Holiness at his residence in McLeod Gunge, uh, looking across his garden to the uh, Doladar Range. So caps on a very clear day. He's very keen on gardening. He admires uh, all the flowers in his garden. And uh, this picture kind of leaves the question, what would happen if His Holiness was still in Lhasa, if he was still in power? And uh, I can't really answer that question, but I can tell you that um, we know that the Tibetan populated regions of the Himalayas outside Tibet have done remarkably well with environmental care and with mitigating the effects of climate change. Uh, Bhutan has set aside 51% of its land area for national parks and wild reserves, the only nation in the world to achieve that ratio. I've been to Bhutan, it's wonderful what they've done. Bhutan has all organic farming, no GM crops, so does Sikkim. And Ladakh has pioneered large-scale solar energy and the order of gigawatts of power, not megawatts, gigawatts, um, because after the Sahara, the Tibetan Plateau is the highest solar potential on the planet. And I stupas, this is where science and spirituality come together. 
uh, ice stupas replicate the action of the glacier. So behind this is the uh, Drikung uh, Kabyun Chetsung Rinpoche, the leader of the Drikung Kabyun lineage, uh, very keen on environmental activism. And he gets the monks and the lay people to work on the ice stupa as well as funding it. And so at this intersection of science and spirituality, I will leave you here. And thank you very much. And we'll turn back to uh, Don Prazi. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Now we have about uh, <clears throat> 22 minutes to have a short discussion. Uh, what I want to ask uh, Dr. Alves uh, is this. Dr. Alves, in your, in your presentation, you talked about renewable energy and solar energy uh, very extensively. Uh, could you link the renewable energy with the global warming? How can, yes. how can global warming temperature can be reduced by the usage of renewable energy for our uh, audiences? Perhaps it's a little bit scientific, but maybe you can explain this better. Yes, I will try it. <clears throat> <laughs> um, let, me, let me answer as a journalist. Every day, also today, we destroy 180 species of animals and plants. Every day, also today, we emit 200 million tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. And every day, we lose 50 thousand hectares of fertile soil. That means every day more people in our planet and less fertile soil. This is not a perspective for a good future. As early as 1972, the Club of Rome stated in its book The Limits to Growth that there can be no infinite growth in a finite world. This is a scientific law that we cannot change. This, that means that all material resources are limited sources. Unlimited, on the other hand, are the intellectual, the cultural, the spiritual, the religious uh, resources. But we use the, these mental and spiritual resources today too little. The Dalai Lama points out in our book that we need to find a balance, a balance between these material and spiritual interests. He also talks about the harmony of these interests, which not only Buddha or Confucius called for. Um, new findings in the natural sciences are waiting to be discovered. The Magna Carta of this knowledge is nature knows it better. Let's go to nature's school. The United States biologist, Professor Wilson, says unspoiled nature is like a magic world. The reservoir of knowledge and uses it holds for us grows larger the more we draw it, we draw from it. The new findings of biology, physics, and chemistry show us a universe based on cooperation, empathy, creativity, and self-organization. We need also a new balance between technology and ethics. This is the, uh, the, the, the spirit of that was the Dalai Lama says in our books. A, a new balance between material things, between men and women, between economy and ecology. Then we can preserve what preserves us, the water, the air, the soil, the animals, plants, and the trees. Thank you. And Thank you. the complete change 
from the old energies to the new renewable energies is the precondition for a good future for, for a good climate in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodars. Um, <clears throat> maybe I turn to uh, Michael. Uh, very good presentation, Michael. Perhaps uh, you could, uh, uh, whilst we are talking. You should, you should have given me one hour. <laughs> Perhaps uh, you talked about your first visit to Tibet was in 1990s. Uh, no, 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 85, 1985. 1985, okay. And the last was uh, in 2010. Yeah. Uh, in terms of your uh, uh, experience, how much deterioration of uh, environment uh, in terms of uh, glacier melts, in terms of uh, damming destructions taking place in Tibet that you could visibly see during those uh, span of years? Um, I think quite alarming. Um, <laughs> you know, initially when I got to 1985, there was no mega dams of any sort in Tibet. Um, there was no mining because it was not economical to export the minerals. Mm -hmm. There was some mining, but not on a vast scale. Uh, I think what really changed everything was the train. Uh, the train arrived 2006, and since then everything has gone skyrocketed because you, suddenly you're able to export groundwater in bottles, little bottles coming out of Tibet. You never saw that before. You know, when I was in Lhasa, originally we had no way of getting any food or water or anything. There was about 10, or 10 shops where you could actually buy anything. And then suddenly, you know, you got 15 brands of bottled water and then 20 brands of bottled water, then 30 brands, you know. So it, it happened right before your eyes. Now, you can't see glaciers melting. You cannot see that. It happens over a period of time. However, we know that it is happening and we know that black soot is responsible for 50% of the melt, possibly. The other half is CO2. And guess who's the biggest polluter on the planet that's causing that? That's China, uh, followed by India. Uh, but China's way out in front. There's not even a comparison. So um, it, that can be stopped. You can stop like soot. All you have to do is tell people not to use fossil fuels. But of course, they're not going to do that overnight. But certainly, we can change cooking fuels, which is one of the part of the problem. All these people burning coal and burning wood, and that's raining down on the glaciers. Uh, that can be stopped. You could just use better cook stoves. They've introduced them in Nepal. It's, it costs money, and solar, solar powered stoves, they've got them in Tibet. Tibet's fantastic for solar energy. So in terms of what I've seen, yes, I've seen things before and after, and I tell you the things after are not very happy. They're not very good, not very pleasant, especially since the train that is allowed for mining. And that has uh, really changed the whole grassland landscape. It's changed everything. You know, the nomads have moved out. A lot of Chinese have moved in. We've seen the whole destruction of the whole nomad culture between 1990 and 2020. It's gone, pretty much gone. You can see in Kamenamdo some places, you know. Anyway, on, on to something else, more pleasant maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I, I, I like to uh, draw uh, <coughs> Dr. Uh, Earls. Uh, can, you, you talked about resources are limited. And uh, in your book, you have the uh, uh, paragraph or the uh, section where you say, managing the nature against, but not working against it. How do we reconcile this into the situation of uh, the huge damage of glaciers, permafrost, and rivers? system in Tibet. How can we bring this all together? How do we manage the nature and working against it? How, how do you see this thing? <clears throat> um, I think <clears throat> we have uh, a, a chance to, to change the problems. Uh, today I have more hope than I did a year ago. In the United States, Donald Trump has been voted out of office. That is a good, this is, was very good. Mm -hmm. President mm -hmm. Biden has returned to the Paris Climate Agreement and announced that the United States will be climate neutral 2050. 
and will produce all electricity in the United States renewably by 2035. This is a good message. That is a big step forward. Secondly, the European Union has announced Green New Deal. Germany has announced it will be climate neutral by 2045. These are all advances. However, at COP26, <clears throat> all these pledges must be laid down in concrete and practical terms. This is very important. The decisive factor is not theoretical announcements, but concrete steps toward implementation. All climate scientists agree that the 100% switch to renewables is possible in the next 10 to 15 years. The technology is completely available. There are examples over this all over the world. Costa Rica, for instance, or Iceland, for instance, produce nearly 100% renewable electricity today already. And this is possible in all countries. This is my hope. Ah, that's, Michael, you want to say something on that? Uh, yes, I want to talk about this carbon neutral thing. I think it's a smokescreen. We're talking about 2050, 2060. I mean, this is far too late. We have to do it next year, 2030 at the latest. So China is talking about carbon neutral in 2060. Xi Jinping will not yeah. be alive in 2060. He's talking about something that's up in the air. And you know what part of his program is? Part of his program is to replace coal with hydropower. Guess where he's going to get the hydropower from? He's going to ruin the rivers of Tibet to get his carbon neutral. That's what he's going to do. He's going to go to the Great Bend of the Sun Pole, extract 70 gigawatts of electricity, and he's going to call that carb that's sustainable. It's not sustainable. You can't do it. What they've done in Bhutan is carbon neutral, but even uh, even in Bhutan, they, they're utilizing dams. They're making big dams that they expect they export all the hydropower to India. That is not sustainable either. But uh, Bhutan's one of the best countries in the world for you know using uh, using the resources properly. But even they, uh, you know, they don't see the, the way that what they're doing there. So I think, you know, it's all fine for these leaders to get together at the COPs, but, you know, there's no enforcement. Without the enforcement, we can, you know, they can just change their plans in five minutes. They can just say, oh, you know, Japan, they had Fukushima, and they said, oh, okay, nuclear power is down, so we'll go back to coal because we can't have nuclear now. You know, they just switched around like that, boom. They, all their commitments went down the tubes. You know, they, there's no enforcement. Without any enforcement, you're never going to get anybody to agree to anything. No. Yes, uh, the change the change is not possible in the next year. I don't think so. But no, in the I next didn't say 10... that. But I'm saying when they, let's call it five years or ten. Yes. <laughs> uh, 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 okay, ten or fifteen, I would say. <laughs> oh, hydrogen. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is a part of the solution, but not yes. alone the solution. Uh, it's very important to produce hydrogen from renewable energies, not from old. Energies. We can produce hydrogen from sun and wind energy, and that is a big chance. We must uh, go to this way. Hydrogen from renewable energy. That is a part of the solution, a very important part. And we, we may also come up with new solutions that we haven't even invented yet uh, that may work. I mean, uh, you know, there's always new solutions coming up. Uh, nuclear energy is undervalued because it's a bit of a hazard if it, something goes wrong. But there may be something similar to that that we may, uh, you know, use to solve our problems. There's always new forms of batteries and things that are coming up, you know, so it's future technology may work. Yes, uh -huh. yes I, think, I agree with you. I think there is agreement that uh, we have to go for renewable energy. But for our listeners, um, first, uh, maybe uh, um, I'll invite uh, Dr. Arz. How do you how do you see the renewable going into renewable energy will uh, reduce the temperature of global warming? How 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 is the mechanic going to work? Yeah, uh, it, it is very important to understand. Renewable energy means no CO two emission, and therefore the change to renewables is a solution for the climate change. We have, with renewables, no uh, CO2 emission. 
that is a big advantage. Thank you, thank you. And and Michael, uh, how 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 do you think? Uh, do do you think China uh, don't uh, you you okay? You said uh, they are going to use um, hydropower using the Tibetan rivers, but uh, yes. they also must know that uh, with this uh, glacier melt that is uh, on course for finishing all the glaciers in 50, 60 years, mm -hmm. they will also think of other renewables rather than the water itself, because that rivers will stop flowing. Yes, unfortunately, China only looks at solutions when they're absolutely in a crisis. Um, you know, it happened on the Yangtze. There was a massive flooding back in the 1990s, and they, they got the scientists to investigate, and guess what happened? They said, because you cut down all the trees and come, and Ando, that's why you're getting all the flooding. So they said, oh, okay, we'll put a moratorium on logging trees. But it was too late. They'd already done it. And that's their, that's their way of solving things, is wait until they get a massive crisis. But I tell you, their solution with dams is, is not tenable, because for me, dams are not sustainable um, or renewable, because the fact is that they produce more CO2 and methane than a coal-fired plant does, usually because the reservoir has rotting vegetation, and that releases methane. And um, you know, stagnant water, it kills the river. So you're killing the river to provide your sustainable energy. But China goes with this green dam myth, which a lot of countries do, that you know, this is sustainable, this is renewable, Maybe for small dams, yes, it's possible, but then you will run of the river where there's no there's no reservoir. That's possible, but not with big dams. It's been proven time and time again. They're a hazard. Mm -hmm. They're they're uh, you know dangerous for the environment. And and uh, we got uh, about uh, six minutes, but uh, I, I want to ask this question to both of you. His um, Holiness talks about uh, preserving environment, uh, and he is spreading this as a universal responsibility uh, must be shouldered by every individual. So, uh, so how, how do you uh, see the rest of the population uh, taking this challenge up? Okay, we can blame the government uh, that they are not doing this, this and that, but how individual, which His Holiness has always says, individual is the you know, uh, center of everything, and he is saying universal responsibility is the answer to environmental protection. How can each individual contribute to this so that, uh, you know, what he sees will happen? Maybe Do Dr. Alz. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In our book, uh, in our book, His Holiness says, Every person in this world, in our time, is uh. at heart of the solution. Uh, uh, it's it's, it's a, a, a part of the problem. We must be we, we, we must be a part of the solution. And uh, he said three things are very important for for everyone. Firstly, environmental education. Environmental education about the consequences of the destruction of our ecosystem and dramatic decrease in biodiversity must be given top priority. But creating awareness is not sufficient. We must find ways to bring about changes in the way we live. I call, said the Dalai Lama, on the younger generation, the B rebels in demanding climate protection and climate justice, because it is your future that is at stake. The second thing is universal, universal responsibility. It's no, no longer enough to think only of my country, my people, my religion, us and them. We must all learn to work for the benefit of all human beings and all lives. Humans are soci social animals, said the Dalai Lama, born with a sense of belonging to a co community. We have to realize that just as our future depends on others, others depends on us. Our world is deeply interdependent, not only in terms of our economics, economies, but also infecting the challenge of climate change. We have to appreciate 
that local problems have global ramifications from the moment they begin. The climate crisis affects the whole of humanity. Therefore, we need today a universal responsibility. And lastly, we need a revolution of compassions, said the Dalai Lama. And that means we need a revolution of compassion based on warm heartedness that will contribute to a more compassionate world with a sense of oneness of humanity. The entire human family must unite and cooperate to protect our common home. We need more sustainable way of life. A more sustainable way of life, that means sustainable economy, sustainable traffic, sustainable energy, sustainable agriculture. With this strategy, we have enough for eight or ten billions of people. The United Nations says it is enough on this planet, it is enough for 12 billion peoples. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Um, yes, I think as His Holiness has mentioned, the COVID-19 is uh, teaching us a lesson in uh, universal responsibility. We cannot solve this one country alone. It's, it's an international problem and we all have to pitch in together, especially China, which is um, the source of the problem which has not pitched in. Um, so, you know, the thing is, I think uh, environmental crisis should be a subject in school. You know, let's replace geography with environmental crisis. Let's face up to the fact that it's no longer geography we're talking about. We're talking about the demolition of geography. We're talking about the demolition of Antarctica, the demolition of the Arctic, the demolition of the third pole. You know, forget about geography. Let's go for the demolition. You know, so it has to be education, but it has to be more radical education. It's not happening. Now I'll give you. I'll leave you with one thought here. You know, Bhutan has done everything right. They've got their forests, 70 percent covered. They've done every single thing you could do right. And guess what? They're being affected by glacial lake outburst floods, which have, they've not created the problem. The problem is coming from the international community raining it down black soot on their glaciers. They don't do it themselves, but they're they're affected. You know, you know, they've done all the right things, but what can they do? So you know, it's it's everybody's problem, and uh, we all have to pitch in. Oh, lovely, uh, lovely is uh, one hour gone. Um, it is a great. Let's try pleasure. for another hour. <laughs> we, we 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 could we could keep talking and talking, but um, since uh, the only scarce thing here is the time, uh, I want to conclude this by saying thank you so much for uh, Dr. Earls and Michael Buckley for your hugely and important contribution. Uh, and uh, I think uh, this His Holiness environment is such an issue, uh, not only for him, not only for this world, not only for now, it's for the future. So it's a great contribution. Many things we learned. Thank you so much. With this, I would like to conclude uh, with all our prayers. Uh, and I hope from all of us, which you have extended already, that uh, we wish His Holiness the long life and that his uh, visions and aspirations in, for the world will be fulfilled as soon as possible. And with this, I would like to conclude this webinar by saying thank you for the panelists and thank you for people who have been joining us through the Facebook. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.